Well, over the last few weeks, you know, we've been talking about the kingdom of God in our Sunday message series that we've been calling Larger Than Life. And you might have been wondering, why is it called Larger Than Life? I don't get it. It's kind of a silly name for a series, but it's actually not because larger than life is what the kingdom of God is. It's larger than life. It's a place of unparalleled peace, joy, and love. It's a place where the most important things in life are not uh, hard to find, but they exist in abundance, super abundance. It's a place that includes everyone, not just perfect people or people who think they're perfect. And the good news is, as we've been saying, that is that you can actually live in this kingdom right now, even while you go about your daily life. And that's because the kingdom of God is not just some perfect place you go to in the future. It's a choice you can make now. And you can start to live in this other world right now, today, when you decide to follow Jesus more closely and grow in your faith more deeply. Now, maybe you've been thinking, maybe you've been coming every week or watching this uh, series every week, and you're, you're starting to think, Father Roger, that just sounds a little too easy, right? I mean, just kind of start living in the kingdom? I mean, what does that mean? It's too easy. I, like most people, you've probably got some real problems and issues that weigh you down from time to time, like I do. Maybe you've got a job that you don't like and you trudge off every morning to that job because you've got to pay the bills. Or your teenager is making some bad choices and you have no idea how to get through to him. Maybe you're arguing with your spouse more than usual or someone you love is battling cancer or some other illness and you feel overcome with grief. The Bible promises a time in the future when God's kingdom will finally come in all its glory. And on that day, evil and suffering will end. I mean, that's what we heard in the second reading. God will wipe every tear from our eyes, and there will be no more death or, or mourning or wailing or pain. And when that time comes, the old order that has dominated and crushed humanity will pass away, and God will make all things new through Christ. When, as St. Paul says, when Christ hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power and put all his enemies under his feet, that's when it will happen, and that truly will be a great day one day. But until that day, all of our lives will continue to be marked by a mix of good and evil. Joy and suffering will always be two branches of the same tree. So you might be wondering, how is it that I can, you know, live in hope and joy and stay positive in this kind of imperfect world? God tells us that good wins in the end. Great. But that's a little bit of cold comfort, isn't it? What do we do with the suffering that we're experiencing right now? Well, that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. How to live with hope for a better future, how to live with joy even in the face of hardships and problems, and how to find, even find beauty in the world despite life's imperfections. And I think the best way to go about that is to take a look at the lives of the professionals, <laughs> so to speak, the first followers of Jesus called the apostles. You see, every one of the apostles was persecuted. They were attacked by mobs, rejected by society, criticized by competitors, imprisoned by the authorities, beaten and put on trial for their lives. They suffered hunger, exposure to the elements, dangers on every side, and exhaustion from their travels. But they did not complain. In fact, they saw it as part of the job. We heard that in the first reading. They said, it is necessary for us to undergo many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. But they were still able to live with incredible hope and joy. The Apostle Paul put it this way. I love this, I love this quote. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not constrained. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed, and we are not discouraged. 
For this momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to what is seen but to what is unseen. For what is seen is transitory, but what is unseen is eternal. The apostles managed to live in God's kingdom even while they suffered on this earth. So how did they do that? Well, I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from the apostles about how to get through life and and not just get through it, but get through it while living in the kingdom. I mean, after all, that's why we read through the Acts of the Apostles, a book in the New Testament of the Bible. We read through that all through the Easter season to be inspired by how the apostles pushed through all the obstacles they faced and they did it with joy and hope. But here's a few things that that just I want to share that that I've been thinking about this week uh, from the lives of the apostles that may help us all to live with more hope and joy in our small troubled world. So the first thing that I picked up on is that it helps to recognize your own imperfections. A friend of mine once told me that she was at a party talking to someone when she got a whiff of a terrible odor. It was faint, but definitely noticeable. And as the conversation went on with this person, the smell got worse and worse and worse. It was obvious it was coming from the person. How awkward, right? Well, eventually she managed to escape and she started talking to other people. But every person she talked to smelled just as bad. They all reeked. It was so strange, she said. Eventually, she left the party and went home. She had had enough. But then she smelled it there, too. Had the odor somehow trailed her home? Well, she finally figured it out when she opened the closet doors in her bedroom and realized that a skunk had gotten in. And she, I guess, didn't notice the odor when she was putting on her dress, but she finally realized that she was the one who stunk. As you can imagine, she was mortified, right? See, it's part of our fallen human nature to blame the other person, right? You're the one who stinks here. Most of our impatience and negative judgments, and by the way, I hear this all the time in confessions, it is the number one most confessed sin is impatience and negative judgments about other people. And I think that these actually come from our unrealistic expectations of perfection, standards which we impose on others, but we never look to ourselves to admit our own shortcomings. And I think it's better to be honest about your own imperfections because it'll make you a whole lot more forgiving (laughs) and merciful to other people and just happier. And this is what the apostle Paul did, right? He gladly boasted of his weakness. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, he says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. And then later he said in his letter to the Romans, he said, You are without excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for by the standard by which you judge another person, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, do the very same things. But when you're able to recognize and accept your own imperfections, then you'll know how to find peace by living in God's kingdom. That's just, that's one thing. The second thing that I learned from the apostles to living in an imperfect world with hope and joy is to, and it's, and it's kind of related, it's to let go of your expectations that life is going to be perfect. This is something I suffer with terribly. It's, I tend to flip out when something goes wrong. I mean, I flip out when the lights go bad or the sound is bad or, or the altar servers don't show up or something's not right or the pianist misses a key, which never happens with you. I know that. But, you know, I just, I'm like, it's not perfect. And, you know, we work so hard that when something's not perfect, it stands out. And so I kind of flip out about it. So this one really speaks to me. And what I've learned is that if you expect perfection, you will be disappointed every time. When the apostles faced rejection, you know what they did? They didn't melt into a puddle of water. They didn't, they didn't fall into despair. They didn't throw a temper tantrum. They just calmly moved on 
Jesus taught them that. Once, when they were in a town called Antioch preaching about Jesus, we actually heard this in the first reading last weekend, there were a bunch of Jewish leaders there who stirred up a persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and they kind of expelled them from the city. So what did the apostles do in the face of that rejection? They shook the dust from their feet, and they moved on. What does that mean? It's a Bible term to shake the dust from your feet. It kind of means that, you know, that statement that we hear a lot, that motto, keep calm and carry on. That's kind of what they did. They just kept calm, shook the dust from their feet, and walked on to the next town. And the reading says that the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit because they were willing to give up their expectations of perfection. One of my favorite stories is about the opening day of Disneyland on July 17th, 1955. Was anybody there? Anybody here? You, everybody's laughing, but actually, you were there? July 17th, I want to talk to you after Mass. There was a gentleman this morning after the 7.30 a.m. Mass who was there on opening day. But few people know this. So many things went wrong. Hours before the opening, Hundreds of workers were still sawing and hammering away and pushing dollies here and there and painting attractions up until the last minute. In fact, there was, a, there was kind of a, um, an urban legend in Disney circles that if you were there on that opening day working with all the workers and you stood still for more than 10 seconds, you'd get painted. <laughs> they were exhausted from a completely unreasonable deadline to get the park open on time. The toad ride lost power. Only a handful of the other rides were ready and Tomorrowland, well, they would have to wait until tomorrow because it wasn't even close to being finished. The Mark Twain riverboat started to sink with people on it. Water fountains didn't work. And get this, they had actually laid the asphalt hours before the gates opened and the asphalt began to melt in the summer heat and women's heels were getting stuck in the asphalt. And to top it off, someone had painted the exterior door to Disney's private apartment after he had finally gone to bed, exhausted at 4 a.m. that morning. And when he tried to come out to greet the people, he couldn't open the door because the paint had dried. Opening door was such a fiasco that it became known in Disney folklore as Black Sunday. But when reporters asked Disney about everything that went wrong, here's what he said. I don't expect the place will ever be finished. That's what I like about it, that it will always be growing. You see, he saw and knew that he could not expect perfection, even though he demanded it. He knew he set aside his expectations that everything would be perfect, and he saw it as an opportunity to grow. You know, there's always going to be people who try to impose a perfect order onto the world. You know, people try to, by sheer force of will, to make things perfect. But God's kingdom breaks into our world little by little. God's way to a perfect order is gentle and patient. It waits. It suffers setbacks and backsliding. It's a slow path to a better world. So maybe if we could all just let go of our expectations of, of, of perfection and learn to live with the imperfect, we'd probably start to feel the kingdom come alive more and more in our lives. Well, one last lesson, one last lesson I want to share with you about living in an imperfect world with hope and joy is to not actually just tolerate imperfection, but to actually find beauty in it, something to love in all the flaws. I recently came across a 500-year-old Japanese art called Kintsugi. And this art, it, it puts broken pottery pieces back together. The artists spend hours and hours crafting a perfect vase. And then, when it's done and dried, they intentionally take a hammer and shatter the vase into pieces. And then, they reassemble the vase with seams of gold to cover the cracks, and to highlight the imperfections so you can't miss them. The blemishes are intentionally left visible because as the artists like to say, you are more beautiful for having been broken. 
On the evening before his crucifixion, Jesus told his disciples, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in him. What did he mean by that? He's not talking about the glory of some shining moment, you know, that most of us would imagine. The glory Jesus was spoken, spoken about, spoke about, was the cross, the awful cross. Because on the cross, God's unconditional love was revealed for a broken world. On rough and splintered wood, Jesus endured the crucible of the cross in order to piece together the broken shards of humanity. He was broken because we are broken. And did you know that when he was raised from the dead in his glorified body, did you know that the scars of his crucifixion were still visible? Did you also know that the nail marks in his hands and his feet, the wound in his side, will always be visible for all eternity? They are the glorious battle scars of his undying love of an imperfect world. And after Jesus told the disciples that he would be glorified and God would be glorified in him, he gave them a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. That's the hardest commandment of all, isn't it? Because every human being in your life, I guarantee this, every human being in your life right now, including yourself and myself, is hopelessly flawed and imperfect. They are like that shattered vase. But like a Kintsugi artist, God patches them up with forgiveness and puts them back together with bright gold seams filling the broken spaces. Find something to love in all the imperfect people around you and the kingdom of God will be yours right now. God's kingdom is here and it's not here. It's right now, but it'll only be finished one day in the future. It grows now, but will not be fully grown until the end of time. And if you want to live in that kingdom right now, in a world where good and evil coexist, then try to recognize your own imperfections first. Let go of your expectations that everything has to be perfect. And then Find something to love in all the mess and in every broken person around you. If you do that, I promise you, you will truly inherit the kingdom of God.